Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 38 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, this is Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. So my guest today on the show is Eric Paulson, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we do, let's start with a Jiu-Jitsu quote. And the quote is, one way or another, we're going to hit the ground, and we'll be in my world. The ground is my ocean. I'm the shark. And most people don't even know how to swim. So this has got to be one of the all-time uh, coolest jiu-jitsu quotes for sure. It's actually been attributed to, to many people through the years, including Hickson Gracie, Henzo, Hoyce, and even Halls Gracie, uh, as well as Jean-Jacques Machado and Hegan Machado. Uh, I recently read where the actual originator of the quote is Carlos Machado, in a 1994 Black Belt Magazine article, an article having to do with Hoist Gracie uh, takedowns. And that's when he actually said it in the article, and um, it kind of went from there. But again, one of the absolute best jiu-jitsu quotes of all time. I'm going to say it again just because I, I love it. So it doesn't matter what happens. One way or another, we're going to hit the ground, and we'll be in my world. The ground is my ocean. I'm the shark. And most people don't even know how to swim. Awesome quote, Carlos Machado, and well done. Okay, up next I want to just do something I usually do at the end after the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Uh, I want to just do a little call to action. If you're enjoying the show, and I really hope you are, um, please take uh, one to two minutes is all it should take you. And swing over to iTunes and rate the show. Uh, and leave a comment. It literally would take you less than two minutes. Uh, it'll help me out, uh, help our uh, standing in iTunes. And by the way, I know that some people don't have iTunes. Um, you can always listen to the episodes on the website at gracyjujitsurocks.com. I am in the near future looking at uh, putting it up on Stitcher as well for those who uh, would, would prefer that format. Okay, and don't forget to listen to the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment after the interview. So my guest is Eric Paulson, and Eric Paulson is a, a very interesting guy, uh, been in the martial arts world for many, many years. He is the founder of Combat Submission Wrestling, or CSW, and teaches that uh, out of his Fullerton, California Academy. He's a well-known and respected MMA coach, trains or has trained uh Many fighters, um, Kim Shamrock, Cup Swanson, uh, among others, as well as his most well-known fighter, Josh Barnett. He was also part of the uh, coaching staff for the Ultimate Fighter show, 
and he's he studied extensively catch wrestling and, and really known for that. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize he does. Um, he started out in jiu-jitsu years ago and studied with many of the Gracies way back in the day, as well as received a black belt from Hegan Machado. I first saw or heard of him in an event called Extreme Fighting. And uh, this was an event, I think there were a total of four of them. And it was way back uh, after the initial UFCs started. This organization started uh, Extreme Fighting and... Like I said, I think there were four events. They were really good. Um, Half Gracie was in, in some of them, and it was just a really great early event. It was, it was unlike the early UFCs, uh, this event had um, the fighters wear MMA-type gloves and uh, had rounds, like they are five-minute rounds, three five-minute rounds, I believe. So it's a little more similar to what uh, MMA actually evolved into in that respect. The other event that I saw him in early on was the World Combat Challenge, and this was sometime around the second or third UFC, so it was uh, another event that started. It had a pretty high production value. I, I saw in Black Belt Magazine an article about it before it actually happened, so I was really excited about that event uh, taking place. Uh, the event had categories for grapplers and strikers, and if you were in the striker category, it could go to the, the fight could go to the ground, but only for two minutes, and then they were stood back up. But uh, it was a good event, and um, Eric had a very interesting fight. Uh, we talked a little bit about that in the interview, and Henzo Gracie ended up winning that whole event. Uh, that was the only event of that organization. I was surprised at the time and disappointed, but um, not sure why. But it was a very good event. You can always find that probably on. YouTube or online if you want to check it out. All right, without further ado, let's speak with Eric Paulson. Hello, Eric. Hi, how are you? I'm good, sir. How about yourself? Really great, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome to the show, and thank you so much for taking time to uh, be with us today. Thanks for having me. I know you've had a very long and very interesting martial arts journey, and uh, so if you would just start with telling us how that all began, how you got started in martial arts, and uh, what that's been like for you over the years. Wow. Okay, sure. Uh I played sports as a little kid. Grew up in Minnesota, 1974, 73. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, my mom asked me if I wanted to play or do judo. And I was doing baseball, hockey, and football. And I said, Mom, do I need to really do another sport? And she's like, well, you should try it and see if you like it. It's an individual sport. But I went in there, and I was all excited. And the teacher said, okay, I need an okay. I want to show you guys why it's important to learn how to break fall. And I go, me, 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 choose me. And he chose me and he threw me and slammed me and knocked the air out of me. And I laid on the ground gasping for air. And everyone clapped and was laughing. And that's when I realized that slapstick humor was perfect. And that I could be a comedian if I used my body to make people laugh. Nice. So after Amen. that, uh, I, I competed in this. We had tournaments uh, two years. Fourth, fifth, and sixth. Fourth grade, fifth, and sixth grade, I competed in the tournament. It was an annual tournament, and I won both of them. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, I got in a street fight, and I thought I could use it in the, in the snow, in the street. Try to grab a guy and throw him, and just grab my hair and just punch my face. So then I grabbed his hair and punched his face, and we were holding each other's, pulling each other's hair, punch each other in the face, and that's how we uh, ended up. Uh, that's how I ended up getting into karate. Now at that time, you got to figure back then, so seventy four, seventy five, seventy six, Game of Death was in the movie theaters. Oh, I saw yeah. Enter, I saw Enter the Dragon in a private viewing. It wasn't even in the movie theaters, and then. Uh, I saw Bruce Lee and I go, oh, man, I got to learn to do that. That looks like that would really work. And then, <laughs> then 
after that, I actually went to, uh, oh, no, I watched Game of Death. And that was in the movie theaters. And apparently that's when Bruce had died halfway through the filming of that. So mm-hmm. They had a stunt double. Uh, so I bought all Bruce Lee's books and read about Bruce Lee's fighting methods and the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. I was into philosophy and stuff like that. Got into, my buddy goes, you should learn a punch kick. I went to this local karate school and the teacher was a fighter and I watched him do some stuff and I was like, holy crap, that guy can box and he can kick really well. This is in 76. I was a six, end of sixth grade, seventh grade. What happened is uh, uh, I I got into Taekwondo and it was competitive. It was like sport Taekwondo. So it was all fighting and sparring. No forms, just sparring and stretching. Lots of stretching. My brother is a wrestler and we always used to argue what's better, grappling or kickboxing or striking. And I said, if the guy's good enough as a striker, I think he could knock you out. He really hits you. And he said, no, a wrestler will always win. He'll shoot it and take you down. <laughs> so we used to have fights in the living room all the time. We used to get home from school, and I had a horrible temper. He used to piss me off. But I don't I don't think anyone, you just, you go, uncle, you say uncle? And you go, all right, uncle. And he's like, all right. He didn't say uncle. We would have kept going. And so right. today, he said, today everyone knows how to tap. When we were little, you had to say uncle. Mm-hmm. I remember that, too. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, that's how it started, and then uh, from then it uh, continued. Uh, I got I fought full contact kickboxing. I got into boxing. I fought in full contact kickboxing. Kind of got beat up, and then I realized I needed to get my hands. But I was a good, not a good. I was a great kicker, and then I ended up getting into uh, my dad goes. You know that karate, that's a bunch of scary, Asian, deadly stuff. You should really think about getting into a, a real martial art or a real fight, fighting sport like boxing. <laughs> so I go, well, all right. And he goes, whatever you do when you go there, don't tell me you have any karate background. And I go, all right. So I went down there, and my buddy had to do calisthenics, and I like got really good quick. So they go, do you, would you like to get in the ring and spar? I go, well, yeah, I thought that's why I'm here. So I used to watch my buddy do calisthenics, and then as he's doing calisthenics, I'm in the ring sparring with the guys, and they're like, wow, you did pretty good, kid. I'm like, thank you. And until one time a guy hit me, and, he, and I backed up, grabbed the rope, and I kicked him. So I kicked him. And they go, whoa, oh, wow. whoa, 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 this is golden gold. We don't do that stuff here. What are you, are you crazy? And I go, sorry. And uh, I almost spoiled the Spoiled the beans. And I almost uh, gave it right. away right there. You know, <laughs> my dad goes, "Don't." He goes, "This is separate." He goes, "Do what you're supposed to do. Don't do the other stuff." So, sure enough, that's how it started. Okay. And then I boxed. I boxed, uh, and then uh, I boxed all throughout high school. I was a gymnast. I was a gymnast captain of my gymnastics team, so I was into uh, judo and then gymnastics. And boxing and gymnastics. So it was a great combination. I could kick. I yeah. was flexible. Taekwondo, I could kick. Uh, flexible from gymnastics. And it all, nice. that's how it all started, yeah. After that, I got into, let's see what happened. So, oh, I decided to move to California. Moved to California for uh, martial arts. Uh, I was a model. I went modeling and, and uh, acting, uh, college, and martial arts. And I wanted to go train with uh, Guru Dan and Asano. Mm. That's he awesome. He was in all of Bruce Lee's books. So I went and I went. I ended up uh, in Redlands, Palm Springs. I did Taekwondo and boxing in Palm Springs. And I did. Uh, then when I got to. I went, I went to Redlands on the weekend. A friend introduced me to Tim Packett. So I started going to his garage, and I went to his garage for about four years. Drove there every Wednesday night in Palm Springs. Then uh got into it so much that I quit karate, and then I got into uh, I got into the JKD, all the, all the uh, Dan and Asano martial arts, and then I, I went to the Jet Center, and then I went to the Inasan Academy, two places I always wanted to go. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and I went to both of those and uh, trained trained with uh, Sensei Benny Arquivez, and then I got to actually 
think through class. I had Larry Hartzell and Tim Tackett out, out in Palm Springs while I was there. And then after I left wow. there, and Larry, I had people Larry Hartzell come out and teach grappling. So he's the one that kind of segued me into the grappling. He goes, he said, you know, when all strengths equal, he goes, techniques, your your secret. And he goes, you need to learn how to grapple. He goes, grappling outsets the strikers. You just grab them, take them down, and submit them. Mm. And, what know, a great opportunity. Dan Indesanto and Larry Hartzell. And Tim, Tim Tackett. Tackett. Tim Tackett. Great. And then uh, before that in Minnesota, I had Rick Fay. Wow. And Rick's protege was Greg Nelson. So I got to train with those guys before I left there. Man. Yeah. So he, awesome. he said, yeah, yeah, it was really good. But, um, so after that, I ended up uh, coming to LA. I got to train with the, with the NSM County. Oh, so while I was in Redlands and Palm Springs, um, there was, uh, the Brazilians became, there was a thing that became part of the Brazilian challenge. It was these guys from Brazil. They came and they started, they had an open challenge and would challenge any martial art in the world and they'd beat everybody. And so, so, uh, since we were seekers of knowledge and, and, uh, different martial arts, uh, while I was in Palm, Dead, Palm Springs, they, uh, Tim Tackett, on a Wednesday night, they said, hey, we'll all pitch in. Could you go train with the Gracies and come back and show us a couple techniques just to see what it's like? And I went there, and I had no idea what I was up against. And I, and I went to see Hoy and Gracie in his garage and put on the kimono. And as I, uh, so my first lesson, I thought for sure it was going to be really brutal and Man, he was the nicest guy in the world. He He's like, okay, well, let's say you get a tough guy, grab your chest, and he throws a punch. What are you going to do? And so I poked him in the eye, and he goes, okay, let's say I, I don't need my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> let's say that doesn't bother me. What else would you do? And I was like, I did a goon thing, and I hit him in the bicep. And he goes, okay, but that doesn't hurt. Let's say, you know, and then all of a sudden he showed me the duck under the back to the to the uh, shoulder lock from the bat. So he did, it was all standing self-defense stuff, but it was really cool. Uh, yeah. And I didn't get to hit the ground so much until uh, probably three years later when uh, Hoyan, I think he got so busy, he had Hoist start to do privates with me. And mm-hmm. Hoist and I were at the same age, and Hoist had not been established yet. So when he would put a choke on, he would hold it a little extra and taught you how to tap with every part of your body. <laughs> and if he choked you, he would just keep the choke on there and let you fight out of it. And if you're claustrophobic, you'd freak out and accidentally put your finger in his eye or something like that. That right. happened. Yeah, that happened. But um, uh, so I, I got to learn the self-defense stuff, and then later on the ground, and I was like, and back then, blue belts were black belts. They were like, mm-hmm. oh, we have a group of five black blue belts that come to the garage, and I was like, do you think I could be able to get uh, invited into that? And they're like, you're not a blue belt yet. So and it's for four, about four years with them privately. And then uh, then I got to do a private with Hickson. Because uh, cause, uh, the reason I was doing all this was because I had an idea in mind that I wanted to fight. And so when I got to train with Hickson, he goes, where would you like to start? And I go, can we start on the ground? And he goes, well, of course. He goes, what do you think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is? <laughs> and I go, you don't teach standing self-defense? He goes, are you kidding me? And I, I was like, really? So we get to go on the round. He goes, yeah. Of course, Hicks knows that. He's an expert at it. But right. all the privates he taught were all ground. Takedowns and ground. That was it. Because mm. they always said the fight will end up on the ground. But the right, fights right. usually always start standing, but they end up on the ground. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that's what is funny to always hear. 90, 95% of most fights end up on the ground. I go, yeah, but 100% of the fights usually start standing. So that's why I say you learn how to <laughs> right. wrestle. Also, learn to have a good takedown. Learn how right, to strike. Right, right. So, learn it all. Anyways, that was it. And then, uh, How long so, were you uh, with Hickson? I was with Hitzer for four, almost five years. Uh, I came in. Uh, I should have had my blue belt under Hoist and Hoyan, but I didn't get belted. It was about four years with them, and then almost five years with Hitzer. In 1990, 
I was rolling and he threw a blue belt in the air and I caught it. And he goes, who are you kidding? So I only blew that under Hicks in 1990. Nice. And then I had it all the way up until 2006. Wow. Yeah, I never had a purple belt. Uh, I had three different brown belts given to me by different people. And uh, I just said, I don't want brown belt. I, I don't want to be belt. I, well, I got kicked out of Hitchens because uh, I fought in a bare knuckle fight. And Henzo was fighting. And I turned, I ended up fighting professionally. And he thought, oh, maybe you fight one of my guys. And I said, well, what am I? <laughs> so he's like, yeah, but you train at the end of Sonic here. He goes, you train at two schools. And I was like, well, I'm still your guy. You know what I mean? And he goes, well, maybe it's better now that you're a pro that you uh, train, um, stop training with us. And that's after hmm. I had a bare knuckle fight. I had a bare knuckle fight. I was fighting in Japan. I started at the end of uh, 92, early 93, before mm -hmm. the first UFC. I tried to get in the first UFC, and they said, you'd have to fight at Gracie. You, you can't train with us at fight. So I didn't. But I was at the first UFC. I tried to get on it, and they took Ken Shamrock instead because they were looking for a shoot fighter. Right. So they took Ken Shamrock. Ken Wayne Shamrock is, was his name. I didn't know who he was. And then I found out. I went with him, looked him up at Pancras and Pro Wrestling, EWF, and I was like, oh, okay. So he was over in Japan at the same time, but he had that look, you know, he's big and muscular, and right. that, would, that, that would be a good one for us to fight, because after we beat him, we beat this big wrestler that was muscular and that had some missions. Sure. So that was a good choice for them to make, to take Ken Shamrock. And Ken got to the finals. So anyways, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I got ended up getting kicked out and then the Machados I was a bartender for all these all the top guys so I worked in Manhattan Beach at a bar and all the guys used to come in I used to always say hi and see him and into the UFC and I was fighting in Japan I, I kept my fights kind of secret and, and kind of under I didn't want people to know like guys would go hey where were you this week and I, go, oh, I was just in Japan fighting <laughs> and I go yeah right and I go no I was I go, you were? Where, where did you fight? And so I fought in Shudo back then. And I never would tell anybody. So like like today, every, see, I don't get it. Everyone just brags about when they fight. I'm fighting. Follow me. I was totally opposite. <laughs> I'm fighting. Please don't follow me or watch my fight. And Why, you know, why is that? It was a personal endeavor. It wasn't for everybody else. It was for me. Okay. I want to see how good I could be and how far I could get. And I don't want if there was a chance that I might lose, I didn't want to want my buddies to watch me and get my butt. Uh, it never happened. I never got my butt kicked. I got armbarred once, but I never had my butt kicked. I've never been knocked out. I've never been knocked out in my life from a punch. I've never been choked out from a choke. Yeah. I've been hit a lot in the head, punched a lot in the face. I might have been knocked out one time, but it's a long time ago. And that's neither here nor there from a from a half a bottle of Jaeger, my string of beer. But that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, never knocked out, never choked out. And uh, and I was only submitted oh. one time in my whole career of fighting, and that was by Carlos Newton. I got armbarred because I didn't prepare for my fight. Wow. I lived I lived at home with. I lived with a woman uh, that was a girlfriend, and I was fighting so much with her, I moved out four times in the middle of a training camp. And so I didn't train yep. like I should have, and I went in there, and I took, I, I took, I ran right before the fight. I ran, and when I ran, I couldn't finish my run. I got halfway through my run. I got, I got to walk back to the hotel. My buddy goes, what are you doing? I was like, my, my training partner. He goes, what? He goes, you can't finish your run. Yeah, I've just I've been, I've been in and out of my house, you know, probably four times to this camp, fighting in the gym and fighting at home. Psychologically, I'm just out there, and uh, I, and definitely my lungs aren't there. And he goes, well, could I ask you something? He goes, why are you fighting? <laughs> and I go, well, I live on the beach, and I need the money, and uh, that's the wrong reason to fight. I need the money. i got to pay rent. I said, I need to take the fight. And that sucked because I didn't give it. I didn't give it a fair shake. I didn't train hard enough. Uh, I, I literally 
had half of a camp for a fight that I should have had a full camp for. And the fight was three eight-minute rounds, so I went in there thinking I was going to go knock him out, which is an idiotic thing. Yeah, and, uh, that's, a long, that's a long fight. Well, I'm not... I'm not going eight minutes. I can't even finish my run. Why would I go eight minutes of a, in one round? You know, I watched the, the fight before me go 20, 24 minutes. I was like, I can't go 24 minutes straight like that. I'm going to knock him out in the first round. But he's never been hit in the head. Nobody's ever seen Carlos get hit in the head. I'll bet he's got a weak chin. Wrong. He's probably got one of the best chins ever. He took Anderson Silva to the uh, knee to the chin, and he, he had give him a thumbs up and smiled at him. Wow. Man. Yeah, it was probably the hardest knee in MMA I've ever seen to the face. And somebody not getting knocked out. Yeah. So Carlos has a, a great chin and a thick skull and, you know, and, and, an, unbelievable and, arm, and an unbelievable arm bar. You know, yeah, so, so what happened is you either, when you lose, you either learn from your loss or you learn, you win from your loss. And to me, a loss is a loss if you treat it like that or if you treat it like a learning process or a learning cycle. For me, I turned into Leonard Nimoy. I was in search of the ultimate armbar escape. So I hired, not hired, I went to train with five different guys, five different experts, and asked them how they get their favorite way to get out of a uh, stacked armbar. Because I'd stacked people in the armbar and never got armbarred by anybody my, my whole fight career. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I stacked Carlos and he rolled out. He uh, helicoptered under me because I put my weight over his head. Mm-hmm. And, he, and that changed everything for you. Yeah, my arm popped upside down, you know, and I was tapping him with my foot on his face and he thought, thought I was kicking him so he even tried to break it. Oh, man. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it was a stupid mistake. It was it was really bad. And and so I went to five different experts and learned, learned the best armbar escape from the from when you have the guy stacked. Yeah. The other thing I watched Carlos Newton, so I started watching Carlos going, okay, I hope this wasn't just a one-off thing. And after that, I did watch him armbar a ton of people, and I go, well, the guy's got an unbelievable armbar, so I'm not so <laughs> Right, right. You know, if he was a kickboxer and he armbarred me, I, I would probably That's... burn my gi. <laughs> yeah. Not too much shame in getting armbarred by, by him, though. No, no. He's, well, he, him and uh, Joel Garrison from from uh, his Hammer Club in, in uh, uh, over there in um, where is it Toronto? Those guys got the best judo in the world, mm. the best ground. They're the best, some of the best ground guys in the world. So, talking about some of your uh, your fights, uh, I remember you from way back in the day. And stream cage fighting and then the World Combat Championships. Uh, I remember you had a really great fight with Matt Hume and stream cage fighting. That just uh, stood out in my mind that it was just kind of this back and forth, really Matt great Hume, battle. Matt Hume and I were friends and we had actually had lunch before our fight. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it was funny because I, I, I'm a goofball and I went, hey, Matt, you're going to come out with grappling or striking first? <laughs> I go, because uh, I think I'm going to come out. I'm going to shoot right away. And he goes, mm. and he goes, and I do both. I'm like, uh. Well, you guys were both very well-rounded <laughs> in it and showed some excellent skills for sure. And then with the World Combat Championships, a couple things. Um, well, that's when I got really... kicked out of Hickson's because of that fight. Oh, that's the one? Yeah, I originally went up for the commercial. Wow. I went up for the commercial for that fight. Wow. I got the commercial. I went up as a stunt guy and got the commercial because our demonstration was better than everybody's. Mm. And we were up against Ty Mac. Remember uh, Bruce Leroy? And, oh, yeah. Yeah, Ty Mac. So I was up against him, and we beat him okay. out for the part. And they go, wow, you guys move really well. Do we do your fight? And we both pointed at each other. And next thing you know, I'm an alternate on... I, I just wanted the commercial, and they put me in as the, an alternate on the show. Interesting. Yeah. Well, one thing that stands out about that event, uh, you know how they show the background right before the fighters fight? They show the little clip of them training, uh, and it showed your clip, I think from some of your stuff, uh, maybe in Japan, but it showed you doing these really great takedowns and these uh, leg locks, these uh, knee bars, and I was just like, wow, 
the clips they showed were just super impressive. And I was like, man, that, that guy's got some stuff. Oh, yeah, that's for World Combat. Yeah, our, our, yeah, yeah. That exhibition yeah. was great because one was uh, Sambo and the other was uh, shoot wrestling. Yeah, it was really good. Really good stuff. Impressive. And then the other thing uh, that stands out uh, about that event, I'm sure you've heard this uh, many, many, many times about the uh, the hair thing. And yeah, for those, well, uh, the only reason I had the, the only reason I had long hair is because I had a movie part the following week. I did uh, stunts, and yeah. I had, I had a part. Uh, I was a Viking on the Sinbad movie. It was a Sinbad movie, and we're shooting in Morocco. And uh, I had a part, and it was right after the fire. I was supposed to go to film, and what happened is uh, when I went to go film, they pushed the they pushed the show, and so. I could have cut my hair or got wigs, but back then they're like, oh, no, no, you got the part because you got long hair. You look the part. So wow. I was all excited. Wow. So, And for those who uh, who don't know what we're referring to, um, yeah, you had really long hair at the time. And back then in those events, you could you could grab hair and, and control people uh, using the hair. And you had yours up in a bun, oh. and uh, I think it was James wearing ended up grabbing it and holding you, I don't know, some insane amount of time, 15, 20 minutes, controlling you with it. And I was like, I remember the whole time feeling like, man. John McCauley and James sucks for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was feeling for you because I knew I was like, man, that's got to be tough. But, yeah, that sucks. Well, it's good. I mean, it's interesting to hear that that's why you had long hair. It wasn't just a poor decision for fighting. Well, it wasn't. It was, a, it was, it was it. a business decision because the money that I was going to make from that movie was really a lot of money. So, yeah, no, I was a co-lead, co-lead in the movie Sinbad, and then the movie got pushed, and then I lost the part, and so it, wow. it turned oh, out wow. to be that. But the problem with that afterwards was the. After I lost that part, I was like, well, this sucks. Now what? I could have won $132,000. That's what Enzo made. Even if I would have beat James Waring, it would have been thirty two grand. I fought that fight. I fought those fights. Kept my hair long. The money was supposed to be really good. Lost the part. All bummed out. So I was on Baywatch. I got hired on Baywatch because I could rollerblade, so I was a bad guy. A Baywatch, and I, had, I was a hockey player, and I had to cut the guy off the street. So that was... Back then, I think from that, I made eight thousand dollars for my fight against James Waring and Sean McCauley both. I got fifteen hundred bucks for two fights. <laughs> One thousand five hundred dollars for two fights, right. bare knuckle nice. fights. It's a lot of abuse. Yeah, for so some go- amount of money. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back for a moment uh, into your your journey uh, through your different arts. After the Gracies and after Hickson and everything, you you got involved with the, the Machados for a while, and, and didn't you end up getting a black belt through with the Machados? Like I said, I was a bartender in Manhattan Beach and Venice Beach, and I was all their bartenders. They used to always come in because we had the hottest women in our bar because it was a beach bar. So all the Brazilians used to come in. And so I had all the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu guys come in and all the time because it was like the it was the best bar in Manhattan Beach. It was right on the pier to overlook the water. And all the girls in their swimsuits used to always come in. It was great. So it attracted all the Brazilians. So I used to have Hoist come in. Never had Horian, I don't think. Hoist, Hickson, Limon. Uh, I, I remember when uh, Fabio Santos moved to town, and I remember he sitting in my bar, and I looked at his ear, and I go, oh, that guy must be a black belt in jiu-jitsu. And then he said, yeah, I moved here to teach at the Gracie Academy. And so uh, Hickson came in. It, I was surprised because all the guys that came in, all the Brazilians, none of them drank except Hickson. And Hickson didn't drink a lot. He just goes, I'll have a beer. And I go, are you serious? <laughs> you go, I go, what kind of juice do you want? He goes, hell with juice. I'm having a beer. I'm going to dance. So he would get on the dance floor. And he would just have fun. And he goes, do you think as much as I train, one beer is going to hurt me? And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Point, one, time, one time I had a guy that uh, there was a, an episode of 60 Days where guys were getting their faces and necks slashed with, with broken beer bottles. People were hitting people over the heads with the beer bottles. And I had a guy pick a fight with a guy, and 
I slammed the guy up against the wall. I had this guy up against the wall by his neck. And he turned his beer bottle upside down in his hand, and I didn't even know it. And the hoist was watching it, and hoist walked up behind me, and he goes, Eric, look at his hand. And I'm still talking to him, and he goes, look at his hand, look at his hand. And he stepped back, and he said it again. He stepped in, and he goes, Eric, look at his hand. I looked at his hand, and his beer bottle was upside down. The guy was going to crack me over the face or the head. Uh. So I disarmed him. And uh, it was funny because I totally forgot that Hoist saved me from getting cracked over the head by some crazy guy. I just wow. stood back and watched it happen. That's when the, those were the heydays in Manhattan Beach, and those guys. Were yeah. Stupid. Felt like wild times back then. Yeah. Well, at that time, so I got kicked out of Hickson's at that time, and and so I was kind of bummed out because I was fighting, and, and all I wanted. All I wanted more than anything were good training partners. And, you know, to have good guys you could roll with were hard to find. And I said, I don't care about belts. I don't care about anything. All I want are training partners, good training partners. So we ended up going to uh, – I had a well, – so, so for a while, I was like, that sucks. I met Rico Ciparelli. Rico saw some of my fights, and we had a mutual friend. And he goes, hey. He goes, Eric, he goes, uh, my name is Rico Ciparelli. I'm a wrestler from Dan Gable's school. He told me some of his stuff. I said, well, I just fought a guy named Paul Jones. And he goes, yeah, that guy's not that good. And then I find out later that Rico lost to Paul Jones his red oh, shirt man. year, his red shirt year in wrestling. Uh, the guy was a Greco guy. But anyways, the guy was strong as an ox. Uh, Rico goes, I'd like to help you with your wrestling in exchange for submissions. He goes, you could help me with some striking and submissions. He goes, uh, I'm going to start training all the top wrestlers, and I've got a team for all these guys, and I'm going to manage them. Mm. So I was the, the submission coach for him. I taught Rico Ciparelli catch wrestling, and he taught me wrestling. I had, I had him for five years. And then I got uh, Higgin came in. He said, hey, Eric, how's your jiu-jitsu? And I go, uh, I was all bummed out. I go, it's not existent. And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, I, I, I kind of got kicked out of the other school I was at, so I don't really have a place I can train. He goes, why'd you get kicked out? And I go, I fought in a bare knuckle fight uh, on TV, and apparently they thought it was a challenge to maybe some future fighters they may have, which I never was. And uh, I got let go. I'll tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, Higgin, I would like to train with your brothers. Uh, you have, there's five of you. If I could train with you, that would be great. I don't know if it's possible. Could you talk to them and see if it would be okay? I know we're stuck in a political time warp here, uh, and uh, I guess I'm the blunt to the joke, so if you could ask. So they had to, he had to ask all his brothers if it was politically correct for them to take me as a student to help me out so I could continue to fight. And uh, so he didn't let me come and train. So I went and trained with them. That was 94, 95. And then, and then I competed in the Pan Ams in 96 in Redondo, Blue Belt, and got a gold medal. Nice, nice. And I had never been belted again until 2006. I met Blue Belt mm. for almost 16 years, maybe 16, close to 17 years. Wow. That was pathetic. I watched all these guys around me. Get down, yeah. But I was, because I was stuck, and I was training every day, and I was grappling every day without a gi, uh, and fighting every, sparring and grappling, and I had camps and training all the time, and because I wasn't, I, I kind of got pigeonholed and mm -hmm. figured out. You know, this guy goes, well, it's because you quit training. I go, I never quit training. I, I trained the whole time because I had fights. I had to train. Right. Because I, um, I got kicked out of class, I couldn't wear a D. Because nobody wanted to train with me because if they heard that they were training with me, they, they would have gotten in trouble back then because you weren't allowed to train with other people outside your school. So so I, it was just, I just said, all right. So that's why I started wrestling. And I got my wrestling up to speed, and then 
And then Hagen allowed me to come in and start training with him. So I thought, he said, you have to change your, uh, you can't wear the Gracie patch anymore. You have to wear the Machado patch. And I go, if you're my teacher and you'll accept me to train with you, of course I'm going to wear your patch. I go, why would I wear someone else's patch that doesn't give a crap about me? Uh, you know, you're actually officially concerned with my well-being and my grappling, and then you invited me to your school, so of course I would do that. So, I, you know, that's when I changed from the from the Gracie uh, lineage to the Machados. Right. And, you know, I was heartbroken because, you know, here I idolize these guys, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm told I can't train anymore. Yeah, it sounds like back then there were there's a lot of politics. Going on. I could only train with them after I was done fighting. Even later on, I'm looking at all these Gracie fighters. I'm like, really? I don't know. It was a double-edged sword. I just, I got stuck in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you ultimately got your black belt with uh, Machado? Yeah, I got my black belt at Higgins. I got my black belt at Higgins, finally, because he invited me to a black belt class. And uh, I said, well, I'm a blue belt. If I come in as a blue belt and I submit brown and black belts, I go, well, that's not going to look good. He goes, he goes, well, don't worry about it. He goes, just come in and train. He goes, when I stepped in on the mat, he goes, he said to me, he goes, how about this? He goes, just uh, put a brown belt on and see how you roll. And I go, really? Am I getting promoted? He goes, well, let's just see where you're at. Yeah. So I went in and I got... I caught like five or six guys and chokes and arm bars only. No crazy weird submissions or neck cranks or wrist locks or foot blocks. I went in there specifically to only do arm bars and chokes. Mm -hmm. And then it was six months after that I got I got my black ball under Higgins. Nice. How did that feel? I know part of you were probably a little soured by the whole no, I was, thing and the politics, I was but excited. I was excited because yeah, I was about to say it had to feel good. Yeah, it was just weird because there were so many of my students that had been that I had trained that were black, that got their black belt so many years earlier, and you know it's like they go, oh, I did strictly jujitsu. I go, well, what do you think I did? I, I roll. I was rolling regularly with guys and fighting, competing regularly. You know, half these guys they got belted. They never even fought or competed. Uh, right. But it definitely took you uh, down a different road, but but you know, in some ways, it really worked out. It forced you to look at other avenues. Like, how did you get well, into pet wrestling? Here's the deal for me. I think uh, I tell people like, oh, don't worry about your rank. It doesn't matter. Mm. What's the most embarrassing thing is if you're if you're a rank under if you're under ranked. Mm -hmm. and you compete against a guy who's a higher rank and you're submitting them regularly, then that's your teacher's problem, not your problem. Mm. It's just, yeah. And it's not about winning. It's about finding training partners and having great guys to go with. It's the only way to get better. And then compete. Okay, nice. And how did you get your start, or uh, how did you get going in catch wrestling and Shuto and all that? Shuto is my catch wrestling uh I trained with Cynthia Yuri Nakamura since 1987. I did a seminar with him, and uh, I was a blue belt. No, I wasn't even a blue belt yet. I started in 87, 88, 89, 89. I think it was 89. I was a blue belt. My my roommate was a blue belt. We were blue belts under Hickson. And then I, my timeline's a little off. But anyways, uh, so... Hickson, uh, this guy, we both had enough about the same privates under uh, the Gracies at that time, so we kind of both knew the same moves. So, because if you do privates, you kind of taught the same format of techniques uh, for privates. And so, mm -hmm. anyways, next thing you know, next thing you know, uh, I saw a Shudo seminar at the Inosano Academy when I was, I was at the Jet Center, and I drove by and said, Punch, kick, throw, salto, submit. And I go, punching, kicking, salto. That means throwing and submission. Wow, that looks interesting. I, and I took my first shoot seminar. It was Sensei Yuri's first seminar. And I took it. And I learned 38 techniques I'd never seen on the ground. And I went back to my uh, apartment. 
and we put mats on our floor, and I go, hey, do you want to roll? And he goes, yeah. And I neck cranked him, and I foot locked him. <laughs> and I know where he goes, holy crap, what's that stuff? And I go, it's my secret weapon. <laughs> you had a bunch of new toys. And so, so for me, for me, it was like he gave me the uh, it gave me the edge that most people didn't have because nobody knew that back then. Mm. Nobody knew footlocks and neck cranks. Right. And, and they have more than that. They have a lock flow. The lock flows. There's ten lock flows, and each lock flow has six to, to thirty techniques. Approximately one through ten lock flows is 150 submissions. With, wow. with variations, and as a shooter, I got my shooter certificate in 1993 under the founder of Shooto, uh, Sensei Sayama, and he, uh, you have to know the 10 combinations, you have to be affluent in, in striking, throwing, and grappling, all three, not just two or one, and that's how you get your shooter certificate. So I was one of, I think right now there's only five in America, uh, shooters. Uh, I got mm. originally from Sensei Sayama. Satoru Sayama, Tiger Mask, I got it on my birthday, which was June 28th in 1993. Nice. Yeah, and that's, I had learned uh, catch wrestling from, from Sensei Nakamura since 1987, all through my early jiu-jitsu days, but I could never put the two together. Uh, it was either catch wrestling or jiu-jitsu. It was hard to kind of combine the two, and a lot mm -hmm. of the techniques were illegal, like knee bars and heel hooks. Toe holds, you weren't allowed to do a lot of that stuff, and most of the guys didn't even know what they were, so you could catch guys with them all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. now every jiu jitsu guy in the world does leg locks, they were non existent when I sort of first started fighting. The only thing that I used to see was the Achilles, the figure four Achilles lock. Yep, and this led you to ultimately starting your own uh system, the CSW Combat uh, Submission Wrestling. Yes, uh, CSW basically is a blend of about five different arts. Well, actually, we have, um, for the grappling, we do uh, heavy heavy emphasis on wrestling, takedowns, throws from uh, judo, sambo, and, and wrestling, freestyle and greco, folk style. And then we do a lot of wrestling on the ground, transitions, turns, tilts, uh, then what I added to that was if you want to get good, you have to be able to turn people over from the turtle. So turns and tilts from the turtle, passing the guard, how to pass the guard, how to sweep and reverse people. So your sweeps and reversals in the guard. And then uh, how to fight from your knees also. Takedowns from your knees applies to the same as takedowns from your feet. It just saves people's knees like beginner's knees. It saves their knees from getting broken or tweaked uh, when you're doing takedowns with new people. Mm -hmm. And then you start in a turtle position, or you start in a butterfly guard, or the half guard, or uh, you start on your knees. So I combined uh, I combined these arts: uh, catch wrestling, sambo, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo, and wrestling. And it's kind of a hybrid system, and it's, it's very aggressive, and it's got uh, elements of all different of these uh, different arts. Out. And, and for, uh, you know, Josh said, I've never had jiu-jitsu in my life. I go, well, you train with me, and there's jiu-jitsu in what we do all the time, so that's crap. Jiu-jitsu isn't just wearing a gi. That's not what jiu-jitsu, right. you know, and I think that's what he was referring to. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, there's no gi jiu jitsu, and and you are learning jiu jitsu because if you didn't, how would you even know what a guard is and a half guard, and how would you know all the things? Because uh, catch wrestling doesn't teach that stuff. Let's talk a little bit about your coaching, and uh, you know, some of the most notable people you've had a chance to coach is Josh Barnett and, uh, and Brock Lesnar and the the Ultimate Fighter show, mm -hmm. and so just share a little bit about your philosophy on coaching and what that experience has been like for you in coaching. Uh, okay, well, when I retired from fighting, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I ended up. Uh, Ken Shamrock said, "Well, okay, so Burn Tiger White said, hey, Eric.'" Uh, 
uh, Eddie Mellis said, you're from the Rolleth, uh, you want to come down and roll with me? And I said, well, where are you? He goes, I'm at Eddie's. I go, okay, I'll go to Shark Tank. I went to Shark Tank and rolled with Eddie and rolled with uh, Vernon. So Vernon told Ken that I was fun and had a lot of tricks and cool things, and I that I submitted him, went after him. And so uh, Ken was still fighting at the time, and he, he Ken didn't have a coach, and he I get a call from Ken Shamrock. He goes, "Here, because Ken Shamrock." He goes, uh, "I want to know if you'd be uh, interested to uh, possibly coach me for my next fight." And I was like, "Well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do now. I guess I've graduated and retired." So I was like, oh, sure, uh, yeah, I would love it. He goes, your style is uh, very equivalent to mine. Uh, you fought in Japan at the same time. He goes, very comparable systems. He goes, I think it just fit perfect. So I trained Ken for eight months and got him ready for it. It was originally tank, but it turned to chemo, and he knocked chemo out with that knee. Ken, I don't, I think he's only had one knockout before, but he, he's a submission guy. He doesn't really knock people out and fight. Yeah. I had him. But I remember that. I remember that knee. That was awesome. I had him. That we worked knees for eight months. That's all we did is knees and kicks and punches. Wow, that's great. Well, you certainly served him well as, as his coach. Well, he won, and then uh, I helped out Sean Shirk. Greg Nelson had me help Sean Shirk a little bit. Uh, Vernon Tiger White helped Vernon for some fights. Uh, he fought Chuck Liddell. He lost, but that was a great fight. Guy mm-hmm. Metzger was supposed to fight Tito, and then he had that aneurysm. He didn't really have it, but it was close, and he was susceptible to that. So, uh, yeah, it was like one thing after another. And then uh, uh, after that, it was like uh, I, I just started getting – I created a fight team out in Orange County out here, and then it blossomed from there. And then Jay, Jay Martinez always wanted to train, and James Wilkes, my student, who won the Ultimate Fighter show with uh, Henderson season. Henderson and Bisbee season, uh, James goes, hey, uh, Eric, you think you'd be interested to train me to fight? And I go, you want to do MMA? He goes, yeah, I think so. I go, are you sure? He goes, I'm pretty sure. And I go, it's hard work. It's not as easy as it sounds. And I am going to be hard on you. I go, but if if you let me do that, I go, I will make you win and turn you into a champion. He goes, okay. So, right. Anyways, uh, uh, that's how the fight practice started. And then I opened another school. Then this is my third school, new school now. Uh, I've got a team of fighters, uh, Josh Barnett, obviously being the most successful out of these guys. Uh, ben Jones uh, had Cub Swanson, Danny Suarez. James Wilkes, uh, Eric Kiahi, Jay Martinez, Bal Levy, Craig Wilkerson, uh, all these guys have fought and been with me for about 15 years. Nice, nice. What a lineup. What yeah, about so, uh, with Josh? He certainly has a uh, quite a run going with Metamorphs right now. Josh is doing spectacular, and he's, he's doing the Ultimate Fighter show. He's getting ready to go against Roy Jones uh, in Japan. So yeah, he's got like he's also got a movie in Thailand. He's doing with uh, John Michael White. Yeah. So well, one thing that stands out about you, uh, in my mind, just from what I've read and um, a few interviews I've I've listened to with you, uh, is your your attitude, your bushido like attitude and philosophy. Coming from a traditional martial arts myself, growing up, uh, some of the most important things that I got from martial arts way back are, you know, a sense of honor and respect for your training partner, for your opponent, for, for, you know, those around you. But in this day and age of, you know, a lot of the modern MMA fighters seem to just have this kind of young punk mentality. But from what I've gleaned from you or from uh, reading about you is that you have this kind of old honor and respectful attitude about life and about fighting. So uh, share that a little bit about that with us. I think everyone should be treated equal. I don't care if you're a new guy or if you're my best guy. Um, uh, and the thing is, is I, I try to change people's lives through martial arts. If you do martial arts the way you're supposed to do it, you're supposed to help people. Life in life, you're supposed to help. You're supposed to help your neighbor. You're supposed to help your brothers and sisters. You're supposed to to, to help people. That's why you're here. You're here to serve. You're not here to take. 
there's a lot of takers, a lot of people that aren't spiritually uh, in tune, and mm-hmm. they're, they're takers. They just come here and it's like me, 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 I, 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 I. It's like really, well, uh, you know. Eventually, I guess you know, I, I pray every day. I meditate every day. Every single day, I meditate. I teach meditation on seminars. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe that people need to help people. Uh, people are sick. You need to pray for them. Prayer does work. I don't care if you uh, believe it or not. It's it's scientifically documented that. No, I completely energy, agree. Yeah, energy changes, and yep. uh, and we are all connected, whether you believe it or not. It's called the string theory. We're all connected. We're all connected to God through a silver cord. We're all corded to God, and we're all connected to each other. So when one person dies, uh, whole humanity uh, receives a loss. And so mm. uh, I, that's what I believe, and I believe that uh, everything that we do needs to be for the betterment of humanity and for society. And, uh, you know, I like to joke around and, and goof off, but, you know, it's, I try to keep it in good taste, you know, sometimes... Uh, it's funny because you're around people and you try to do stuff that to make people laugh and you might like step out of your bounds a little bit. But but all in all, when you're you're uh, trying to tell jokes and stuff, try to keep it clean and make something funny. And, and that's the other thing I believe that uh, I've been gifted with the ability to make people laugh and to be slight and tell jokes and, and goof around a little bit. But then when it's time to go, it's time to stay stay active and stay stay aggressive and go as hard as you can and sweat's a lubricant sweat hard sweat is a lubricant of success and if you mm, that's good. treat that treat your uh, training like that then that's the only way the less you the more you sweat in peace the less you bleed in war absolutely and the thing is is you're going to help every single person that's around you that needs some help and and that's it. So I really appreciate your uh, your time and your insight. You're a very interesting person. So thank you very much for sharing with us, Eric. Thank you very much. And uh, go to ericpaulson.com uh, for more details and information for training and, and everything like that. Thank you very All much. All right. Thank you, sir. Right, God bless right, you. Bye-bye. Okay, time for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today's subject, get rid of the drama. And this is just uh, another way of saying don't sweat the small stuff. You know, many people live life as if it were a, a melodrama, an extravagant theatrical play in which action and plot predominate. Sound familiar? In dramatic fashion, we blow things out of proportion and make a big deal out of little things. We forget that life isn't as bad as we're making it out to be. We also forget that when we're blowing things out of proportion, we're the ones doing the blowing. I found that simply reminding myself that life doesn't have to be full of drama is a powerful method of calming down. When I get too worked up or start taking myself too seriously, I say to myself something like, here I go again, the drama is starting, or my drama is starting, something like that. Almost always, this takes the edge off my seriousness and helps me laugh at myself. Often, this simple reminder enables me to change the channel to a more mentally peaceful station and mindset. If you've ever watched a overly dramatic show or perhaps even a soap opera, you've seen how the, the characters will take little things so seriously as to ruin their whole lives over them. Someone says something to offend them looks at them wrong, or flirts with their spouse. Their response is usually, oh my gosh, how could this happen to me? They then exacerbate the problem by talking to others about how awful it is. They turn life into an emergency, a melodrama. And this causes nothing but a life full of stress. So I encourage you going through your day, your week, your month, uh, to be aware And the next time you feel stressed out, experiment with using this strategy. Remind yourself that life isn't an emergency. And 
turn your drama into peace. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. Hope you're enjoying the show. I, I love uh, hearing about what you think of the show and any feedback you may have. Again, as I stated at the beginning of the show, uh, please take um, a quick minute or two to go to iTunes and rate the show and to leave a comment there. You can also go to the website Rocks and post uh, a comment or feedback there as well. And additionally, you can call and leave a voicemail at 919-251-5053. So thanks again for listening, and until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.